Thomas Wellsby Clark will always be Thank remembered. You, Senator McCarthy, the time for this uh, two minute statements has expired. We'll now move to question time, and I'm calling Senator Hume. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. The Treasurer has stated that the government is acting with some urgency in relation to the soaring cost of gas prices. Minister, will you bring about an end to the uncertainty of the government's policy on gas prices by the end of this sitting fortnight? Thank you, Senator Hume. Minister. Oh my goodness. Number one, number two, uh, Senator Watt. Senator I've got the minister on her feet. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Hume for the question, even though I'm uh, a little bit surprised at the way it was framed. Will we end the uncertainty? Um, we ended the uncertainty with the election of an Albanese yeah, government. Yeah, yeah. We ended a decade of uncertainty, a decade of energy policy uncertainty. How many times did you try and land a policy? 22 and counting, and didn't land any of them. Didn't land any of them. No, you didn't. You didn't. And everywhere we went, the private sector were saying, can you provide certainty? We want investment certainty. We want to understand the approach that government policy will take so that we can make investment decisions. And, and Senator Hume asks me about the uncertainty. I'll tell you what we've done. In fact, since coming to government, uh, Minister Bowen left the swearing-in ceremony to deal with the fact that the lights were going to go out. Exactly. The swearing-in ceremony. We then uncovered a 20 per cent increase in the price of electricity that, that Mr Angus Taylor had covered up, had taken the unprecedented step of covering up and hiding before the election so that it didn't become an election issue. Because guess what? You were told that electricity prices were going to go up and you weren't honest with the Australian people. What we have done is put in the budget the information we have about the increase in energy prices and what the Australian people have is a government that's working hard to look at what options are available for us um, to deal with Senator it. Gallagher, minister, uh, sen pre pre order, President, President, point of order. order. Sen Senator, uh, Senator a, Hume. Senator sen Birmingham. Senator Birmingham, just a moment, please. I'll wait until there's silence from those on my right, Senator Birmingham. Point of order on the question of direct relevance. Senator Hume's question was quite specific to the matters of intervention in the gas market uh, and quoted the Treasurer as saying the government would act with some urgency on that. Senator Hume purely asked whether the government would clarify its position by the end of this sitting fortnight. I ask you to draw the minister, who's had ample opportunity to traverse a whole range of other energy policy questions, to the specific direct question that was asked. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Uh, Senator Wong, on the same point. Thank you. On the point of order, I'd refer you to some of the rulings <laughs> of Senator Ryan, who made the point that uh, opposition members of senators should not be surprised if there's a political statement in the opening of the question if the response to the question is somewhat wider. Uh, the, the senator chose to frame her question in terms of certainty or, or lack thereof. Uh, I put it to you, uh, um, President, that consistent with past rulings, the minister is entitled to pick up the issue of certainty, Thank which she you. is doing. Senator Wong, <coughs> there, there was a preamble to the question, and uh, it did deal with urgency. And I believe that um, the minister is being relevant um, to the question of direct relevance. Because there's a preamble there, I think the minister is entitled to canvas both the preamble and the specific question. I, can I ask you to review the Hansard of that question? The only preamble related to quoting the Treasurer and then the question, the question, it wasn't a preamble, the question off the back of the Treasurer's statement around urgency went to uncertainty in the gas prices and the gas market. I invite you. you to look. It was a very <coughs> tightly worded question, President. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. Um, Senator Wong. Certainly. There was a preamble to the question, however it's phrased. 
there was, and the minister is entitled to go there, but I will review the Hansard, um, but my ruling remains. Um, Senator, Minister, you've got 22 seconds. The second thing we did was deal with the <laughs> lack of supply, um, the supply shortfall that we were advised by the ACCC. And what we're doing now is to sensibly work through options to deal with ensuring we get reasonable prices into the market. That's what the government is doing right now. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hume, first supplementary. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. Earlier today, <clears throat> the Treasurer told journalists, we have made it very clear that we are interested in a temporary, meaningful, responsible, sensible intervention in the energy market. Yeah. Minister, why is it that the government, who couldn't make up their mind pre-budget, they couldn't make up their mind before the sittings this week, now, Order. Order. now Order. can't— <clears throat> now can't commit to doing so before the parliament rises for this year. Um, before I call the minister, I'll remind senators that the person asking the question has the right to be heard in silence, as does the minister. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. And, uh in terms of what this government is doing, we're keeping the lights on, we're addressing the supply shortfall, now we're looking at options around price. Yep. After nine years of delay, neglect and you know, disorderly co kind of conduct across there because no one could agree on what to do, we are cleaning it up. In fact, in terms of power, we had four gigawatts of dispatchable power exit under your watch and only one gigawatt come in. So we're dealing with all of these issues. In six months, we have done more, much more, than you did in your three terms in office. Yeah. And we are working hard to resolve it. We are explaining, and the Treasurer there couldn't have put it better myself in terms of the language he used. It is complex. If there was a silver bullet, don't you think someone would have deployed it by now? We are working through the options sensibly and meaningfully in a temporary way, as was explained during the estimates hearing. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Hume, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, the government's budget actually cut policies and programs designed to increase Australia's future gas supply. And at the same time, it abandoned its promise to reduce electricity prices by $275. Isn't it a fact that only gas market policies that, actually, that have actually been announced by the Albanese government are making a difficult situation worse and not better. Thank you, Senator Hume, Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Madam, uh, President. We're doing exactly what we said we'd do. Where we have um, cut programs, it was because perhaps there wasn't a business case, there wasn't information about what was going to happen with that money. There were decisions that were taken but hadn't been funded. We're cleaning up your mess again there. In terms of passing the climate legislation, we have done that. We're doing exactly what we said we'd do. We're implementing Powering Australia. And the simple fact of the matter is renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy. So if we can get more renewable energy into the grid through our Powering Australia uh, plan, then that will put downward pressure on prices. That is, we are doing exactly what we said we'd do. And in terms of these short-term pressures caused by the war in Ukraine and the neglect of the last nine years, we are working through options that will provide some relief to manufacturers, businesses and households where we can and working with states and territories on that. Thank you, Minister. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Watt. On Friday last week, I travelled to Forbes and Yugara and saw firsthand the utter devastation caused by last week's flooding events. Minister, can you please provide an update on the recent floods across the country and what the Albanese government is doing to support impacted communities? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Sheldon. Uh, I recognise and thank you for your commitment to flood-affected communities, particularly as the government's special envoy for disaster recovery. In Australia right now, there are currently around 200 local government areas which are disaster declared and receiving state and federal support. Many of those are in New South Wales, where 75 local government areas have experienced severe flooding. That's around 60 per cent of all the council areas in New South Wales. These floods bring real tragedy, and our thoughts are with the family and friends of the 10 people who have lost their lives in New South Wales and Victoria to date. These floods are, are deadly, and they are, in many areas, repeated. 
These floods have a real human cost and people are hurting. Uh, Senator Sheldon, I know that you visited Central West New South Wales last week, as did the Deputy Prime Minister, and we've all heard devastating and inspiring stories of resilience and survival. Yesterday, I met with locals in Yugara, where homes were literally washed down the road and house roofs came to rest on cars, among much other damage. I spoke with Snow, who pulled 12 people out of floodwaters to safety, and Kim, who was rescued from her roof by helicopter. I heard stories of neighbours checking on one another and helping with the clean-up. Understandably, the people I met with are deeply affected by these traumatic experiences, and I know they have the support of this entire chamber. I know other communities are going through similar horrors. While in Rochester in Victoria just over a week ago, I saw the damage from heavy, from heavy rains on the local school. I've seen similar damage on homes, crops and businesses in, in Echuca, Moree, Forbes and Parks just since Parliament last sat. I want to commend the heroic work we're seeing from local communities and from local SES, police and fire services. The federal government is currently deploying 200 ADF personnel in central New South Wales as we speak, uh, and it's been terrific to see support from our international friends in New Zealand and Singapore as well. Everyone is supporting oh, these you, communities Senator right Walker. now. Time has expired. Um, Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Minister, I'm aware over the past month you have visited communities across Tasmania, Victoria and South Australia which are out of the immediate disaster and are now entering the long-term recovery. Minister, we know that flood recovery will take months, if not years, and these communities will be reliant on our support. What financial assistance is currently available for flood-impacted communities? Minister. Uh, thanks again, Senator Sheldon. This, uh, this severe weather is very widespread, with disaster declarations for the September-October floods and storms now in effect in New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania and Queensland. As I mentioned earlier, in Australia there are currently around 200 local government areas which are disaster declared and receiving state and federal support. This in includes a combination of support for individuals, financial help for councils and homeowners for clean-up and repairs of roads, bridges and other infrastructure, supports for primary producers, assistance for small businesses and hardship grants for non-profit groups. <laughs> Currently, we're delivering support that will help communities' immediate needs as we continue to assess the longer-term supports that will be necessary to help towns recover and rebuild. The Albanese government continues to work very closely with state governments and councils to make sure that appropriate support is getting where it's needed. I'm very pleased to see such bipartisan spirit, and I acknowledge the, uh, the contact I've had from Senator Davey in her shadow role, Thank along you, with uh, other um, members of the Senator National Sheldon, Party. Second supplementary. While I was in Western New South Wales, many community members raised the state of the roads and their concerns about getting produce in and out of flood of impacted areas. What support is the Albanese government providing to help fix the roads in these communities? Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Sheldon. We understand that road repairs are a major concern for a lot of regions who have experienced flooding. Roads are the arteries of regional Australia, and we need to try to keep them open as quickly as we can. Support for road repairs is currently available in New South Wales, Tasmania and Victoria through the disaster recovery funding arrangements, which are jointly funded by the federal and state governments. These funds provide immediate help for states and councils to repair roads, footpaths, bridges, tunnels, flood levees and stormwater infrastructure. And the National Emergency Management Agency and Resilience New South Wales will be meeting with councils in New South Wales this week to help them with information about what kind of support is available. I'm very conscious that these floods are not just happening in New South Wales. They've been having in a number of other states, and our friends in South Australia are watching with concern about what might be coming down the Murray River shortly. And that support will continue to be in place for every state and every community to repair the roads and infrastructure that we're seeing destroyed. We are standing with these communities, and we will continue to do that for as long as is necessary. Thank you, Senator Watt. Um, Senator Cash. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, what modelling has been undertaken by Treasury into by how much workplace productivity and real wages will increase as a result of the government's industrial relations legislation? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I um, thank Senator Cash for the question. Well, as the senator would know, Treasury does a range of detailed modelling on the economy, and all of that is presented in the budget. It's updated regularly to factor in changing economic conditions as well as policy decisions over time. Uh, the legislation we went through this at estimates. Um, 
the legislation that this chamber will hopefully debate before the end of the year uh, hasn't been settled yet. Um, so, um, you know, the the modelling that the Treasury done has done and the forecasts on wages, assumptions, etc., uh, are all part. You know, uh, have not taken into consideration the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill because it hasn't been settled. Uh, Senator Cash, first supplementary. By approximately how much will real wages increase as a result of the government's industrial relations changes? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, the government has made no secret about the fact that we want to get wages moving again after again after. Um, almost a decade of stagnant wages. Um, we wanted to see wages grow in a responsible way. We're seeing some early signs of that with the wage price index that was, um, I think, released last week, which had wages increasing to 3.1 per cent. But you can see the wage forecasts, the wage price index forecasts that are factored into the budget um, on in uh, one of the budget books, and that has wages growing at three and three quarter percent in 22-23, three and three quarter percent in 23-24, and in 24-25 at three and a quarter percent. Uh, Senator Cash, second supplementary. Uh, Minister, given your government's budget papers show real wages are declining and productivity is decreasing. When will Australians and which Australians will see an increase in their real wages? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Well, again, um, you know, if I can just go through the record of what happened uh, under the previous government. Well, well, there's some context that should be. I know it's an uncomfortable truth. I know it's an uncomfortable truth about Order. what happened to wages because it was a deliberate design feature of your economic architecture to keep wages low. We are dealing with an inflation challenge at the moment, uh, and no one is pretending that wages should be growing at the pace of inflation. But we are seeing wages growth. We are seeing wages growth. When we look at what happened to you, 2.2 per cent a year under the previous government, and we have already seen the wage case, the minimum wage case, deliver uh, over 5 per cent. We have seen the aged care workers, all of the low-income workers that you fought against ever getting a pay rise. Remember, your submission had the benefits of low-paid work in it. We actually want to see um, low-income workers get a pay rise, and that's what they'll get Thank under you, this Minister, government and under the laws that we're going to pass. Senator Cox. The question is to Minister Wong, uh, the minister, uh, representing the Minister for Climate Change. Um, this government went to COP27 telling the world that they are back, which begs the question, back from where exactly? This government has refused to commit to phasing out fossil fuels and continues to give billions of dollars to fossil fuel companies. And today, like every other day, uh, people in this place have the opportunity to stop billions of dollars being given to fossil fuel companies, particularly on First Nations lands, uh, to stop the destruction of land and sea country. My question is, when will this government actually commit to the global call to action by stopping public money to fossil fuel companies? Minister. Thank you. Um President, and thank you to the senator for her question. And uh, uh, she started her question by asking, "From where are we back? We're back uh, from uh, the uh, position, uh, the illogical, irrational, ideological position that was held by those opposite for so many years. Uh, after uh, we lost government, as people will know, there was no." action at home when it comes to certainty, certainty to the energy markets, and there was a very clear view into, about how to behave internationally, which I do not believe is shared by most Australians and certainly not shared by this side of the chamber, including the Greens. Now, you asked about being back. I'd make the point that we were represented by two ministers at the COP, uh, along with the assistant minister, Senator McAllister, as well. I'm pleased to advise the senator that our increased ambition on climate and willingness to engage as a constructive and active global leader has been warmly welcomed by the international community, including the Pacific. We played a constructive leadership role at the COP, uh, and we have made, uh, as um, you know, Senator climate Wong. change a Senator priority. Wong. Please resume your seat. Senator Cox. Point of relevance. My question was, when will this government commit to the global action, uh, call for action on public money 
to um, fossil fuel companies. Thank you, Senator Cox. And there was also a very long preamble, and uh, the minister is entitled to answer uh, those parts of the question as well, Minister. Thank you. And I understand, Senator, that the international narrative sometimes doesn't fit your domestic political objectives, but it doesn't. It doesn't. So I want to tell you what Palau said. Palau said, a member of the Pacific family singled out Australia for our help in, de to, in delivering the loss and damage fund, saying that the tireless work by Australia and others, others reinforced our belief in multilateralism and our unwavering belief that we can solve global problems only by listening to each other and by working together. So this is Palau speaking. And so I understand you want to put a particular position because of your domestic political agenda. You know, we're actually interested in being part of the solution internationally. Uh, and I'd prefer I'll come back and talk to you about what Alok Sharma said at the COP as well, because I think it's instructive and it's useful Thank to you, understand Senator how far Wong, out of touch those opposite were. The question work. has expired. Senator Cox, first supplementary. Uh, yesterday, an agreement was reached in the final text at COP27 regarding the loss and damaged climate fund, which will provide monetary support for countries hit hardest by the climate disasters caused by fossil fuels. Will the government commit to providing its fair share to the loss and damage fund, particularly those here in Australia, but also the developing nations, especially our Pacific neighbours? Thank you, Senator Cox. Senator, Senator Wong. Thank you. Uh, I, I will just I'll respond to uh, loss and damage first, and I might also uh, give the senator perhaps the benefit of hearing what um, the Glasgow COP26 president, Alok Sharma, said. Uh, as I said in my primary answer, Australia did help deliver the loss and damage fund. Uh, as Palau said, we, we contributed to others uh, and reinforced— uh Order. Wow. Order. You, you, you really— <laughs> You just, Minister, you, please continue. Uh, it's just, I mean, one, it's hard to know where to start, isn't it? When, when, we, when we have the Pacific saying to us that they, they appreciate that we have contributed to the loss and damage fund becoming a reality in the multilateral system, we understand, uh, of course, uh, that um, loss and damage is about developed countries helping developing countries deal with the impacts of climate change. It's obviously not about reparations or compensation. Uh, and obviously, from, uh, we contributed uh, uh, respectfully you, the to the architecture. Uh, Senator Cox, second supplementary. This government has committed to co-hosting COP31 in 2026 with Pacific Nations, and Vanuatu's climate change ministers said their support will be conditional on no public money being given to fossil fuel projects. Will this government respect Vanuatu's position, and if so, what is the timeline for meeting this request? Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister. Uh, I know Minister Regan Varno and, uh, and I respect him. Uh, I would make the point that that is not a demand that has been publicly made nor even privately made to me uh, uh, in the discussions with many Pacific Islands around the Conference of the Parties that we want to co-host. We understand the position that the Minister and other Pacific Island nations have, have put forward. Uh, we understand that they have seen Australia over and over again, over years, uh, take a position on climate which, climate which did not reflect the reality of their lives, did not reflect the reality of their lives. But we want to work with them and we want to elevate their voices. We want to elevate the real experience, lived experience of Pacific Island nations, uh, because they have a powerful voice when it comes to climate, and so should they. As Alok Sharma told a Pacific gathering, we now have in Australia a government that is back on the front line of the fight against climate change, and I'd like us to cheer that now. We're very grateful for that support. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Professor Sean Tennell arrived back in Australia on Friday after 650 days in a Myanmar pr prison. What efforts were made to secure Professor Tennell's release? Thank you, Senator Payman, Minister. Thank you. Uh, our senators uh, will have seen, and I'm sure all of us welcome, that Professor Sean Tennell has arrived safely back here in Australia and has been reunited with his wife, Havu, and family after more than 21 months of unjust detention in Myanmar. And his return will be an enormous relief to family, friends and supporters of his across Australia and across the region. Uh, there have been enormous efforts across the Australian government to, to secure Professor Turnell's release, and we will continue to provide whatever consular support he and his family require. 
Can I, at the outset, particularly acknowledge the tireless work of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade? This outcome was the result of sustained strategic engagement and diplomacy by the government and by the department. DFAT officials in Canberra and across many posts in our region played a critical role in bringing Professor Turnell home. And I particularly want to acknowledge the work of our head of mission, Angela Corcoran, her predecessor, Andrea Faulkner, as well as all of the Australian and locally engaged teams at posts. Amongst their many duties, uh, they delivered support packages to Professor Turnell in satchels with the Australian coat of arms, uh, which, as he described both the Prime Minister and I in our, co our separate calls with him, he proudly displayed in his cell. As he said to me last week, he, his line was, don't mess with the, kangaroo, the emu and the kangaroo. I also wish to thank DFAT's consular operations team, led by Ian Gerard, for their extraordinary de dedication and focus and for their commitment and sensitivity to keeping Professor, Professor Turnell's family updated throughout the period of his detention. Uh, one of the finest accolades that anyone could give was given by Professor Turnell, who told me, but due to the work of DFAT and others, he never felt alone. Uh, I commend DFAT and all those who had a role in this extraordinary result. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Um, what role did Australia's partners in our region play to achieve to help achieve the release of Professor Turnell? Minister. Thank you. And whilst the efforts to free Professor Turnell were led by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, there are many others around our region who played a crucial role in advocating for his release. So I thank in this place all those who have advocated for his release, uh, including regional partners and especially members of ASEAN. Uh, I particularly want to acknowledge Cambodia and Brunei Dar es Salaam, the ASEAN chairs of the term of his detention. And I, I know that Senator Payne also engaged with them, and the special envoy of the ASEAN chair on Myanmar. I acknowledge the roles of our friends outside of ASEAN who advocated on our behalf. They include India, Japan, the UK and the United States. Uh, we appreciate the arrangements that were made by Myanmar authorities for Professor, Professor Turnell's release. We welcome also the news of the release of other prisoners alongside Professor Turnell, including uh, uh, Myanmar citizen holders and also foreign nationals from Thank the United Minister, Kingdom, US and expired. Japan. Senator Payman, uh, second supplementary. Uh, can the minister outline to the Senate how the Albanese government will continue to support the people of Myanmar? Minister. Thank you, uh, Senator Payman. Well, uh, I think we all remain deeply concerned about the deteriorating security and humanitarian situation in Myanmar. And we continue con to condemn the regime's brutal behaviour at every opportunity, including in our regional and international advocacy. We will continue to advocate for the release of the remaining political prisoners, including Do Aung San Suu Kyi. We will continue to speak up for human rights in our region, and that means we will continue to engage with those who do not agree with us. As I did decide to directly engage with the Myanmar military regime in order to seek to secure Professor Turnell's release. I did so not because we agree with them, but because we have to deal with the world as it is, but seek to shape it for the better. That is why this government will continue to support the humanitarian response in Myanmar and Bangladesh, including $135 million this financial year to assist with the delivery of life-saving food, water, you, shelter Senator and Wong. other essential time for this question has expired. Senator Roberts. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. It has been four weeks since the Australian Bureau of Statistics published data showing a 67 per cent reduction in Australia's monthly birth rate between July and December 2021 as compared to the long-term average. A startling decrease. I drew attention to this data during Senate estimates, hoping for some reassurance. None was forthcoming. So let me ask again, Minister, why has Australia's birth rate declined from, from June 30, 2021 to December 31, 2021, revealing a 70% reduction? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister. Thank you, President, and um, I thank Senator Roberts for the question. And I recall the discussion that we had at estimates, and the fact that um, certainly um, we requested from Senator Roberts uh, some time to 
go through the information that he tabled in that hearing. I haven't got that information back, but I, I think the advice given um, by the chief health officer, who I was sitting next to, or chief medical officer, and uh, myself was that that the data that you were using was didn't align with with information that we had that we hadn't seen a drop off of that size that would be quite noticeable uh, and in fact that that financial year of reporting which incorporated births was actually the strongest birth record uh, achieved so far that we'd seen more births um, during that period of time so I but I do. I do think we have to come back to you because you tabled some documents in that meeting. Um, the Department of Health took them away, and if there's anything further I can advise you, um, I will do so. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts, first supplementary. Thank you. Minister, that's not as I remember it, but we'll, we'll wait for your response to come back. Is there any systematic information sharing between the Australian Bureau of Statistics and Department of Health to keep an eye on key indicators reflecting on our COVID measures? Or does the Australian Bureau of Statistics just publish critical data like this in due course and hope that somebody notices at some time? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister. Uh, well, the ABS, uh, thank, thanks, President. I thank Senator Roberts for the question. ABS does uh, work alongside other um, departments very closely with the data they are collecting um, and uh, keeps an eye on on tracking any significant changes. So if the ABS saw something in their data that would concern them, which I would imagine the, the um, numbers that you're citing about declines in birth numbers in one month uh, would, would raise um, attention, um, would be dealt with across government. Um, certainly the ABS is looking at um, I think ABS, in their cause of death popular, uh, publication, did report that 15, there had been 15 deaths due to the COVID-19 vaccine in 2021, and that was against uh, vaccinations of 42.5 million vaccines administered in that year. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, what specifically is the government doing to get to the bottom of this staggering decline in births? Minister. Um, thank you. Well, to the first thing, and I, I, I remember this quite clearly from estimates, was that we undertook to have a look at the information that you had tabled in that hearing um, and align that with some of the data that the APS was actually collecting. They collect their um, births and deaths data as soon as they are available based on data from the state and territory registries of births, uh, deaths and, ma and marriages. Um, but I think from the first thing we need to do is, is get to the bottom of the numbers that you had um, provided uh, and just make sure that um, the data that we got from the ABS, certainly that I saw in that hearing, didn't align with those numbers that you had tabled. Thank you, Minister. Senator MacDonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Minister Watt. The mining industry has told the government that tens of thousands of jobs are at risk due to Labor's IR legislation and mining tax 2.0 thought bubble. Minister, will you admit that 33,000 jobs could be lost due to Labor's latest proposals? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, and again, I note that the shadow minister for IR has been banned from asking questions about IR issues, uh, and that can only be because, of course, that everyone remembers uh, the work that the Sen that Senator Cash did as the IR minister. Uh, where she inflicted conflict and low wages on the Australian Order. public. But I'm, of course, happy to hear Order. those questions. I'm happy to take questions Order. from Senator Macdonald, who I know does have a genuine interest in the resources industry. The, um, the, I completely reject the claims being made by some employer groups that the government's industrial relations plans will cost the sort of job numbers that are being thrown around. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons the government is pursuing these IR changes is because they offer the opportunity to deliver a win-win to both employers and to employees. This, under the former government and the policies that they pursued, we had persistently low productivity, 
uh, in, uh, in, in, in inflicting a conflict-based system on employers and employees. And at the same time, they, of course, delivered uh, some of the lowest wage growth that our country has seen on record. Uh, we can have every confidence that as a result of the government's IR changes, should the Senate pass them, and I sincerely hope they do, uh, that employers will win through higher productivity, and that includes mining employers, and that workers will win through getting the pay rise that they have been denied by the former government for far too long. Uh, the kind of claims that we're seeing being made uh, by some groups in the community, backed in by the coalition, uh, are, are not based on fact. Uh, they are not based on the experience of every other country around the world that has pursued the kind of changes that our government is pursuing. Uh, our changes are about driving up productivity and giving workers the pay rise that they finally deserve after waiting so long. Thank you, Minister Watt. Um, Senator Macdonald, first supplementary. The mining industry has told the government that $77 billion of resources projects are now at risk due to Labor's irresponsible IR legislation and mining tax 2.0 thought bubble. Minister, how many of the 140 projects in the pipeline will not go ahead due to Labor's latest proposals? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you again, Senator Macdonald. Again, the sort of figures I, I, I respect the fact that the mining industry and other employer groups are out there at the moment running a political campaign uh, against what our government is trying to do. They have every right to do so, but they also have a responsibility to put facts on the table rather than um, rather than put facts and figures out there that have no basis in reality. Um, anyone who has any contact with the resources industry at the moment, and I'm sure Senator Macdonald does in her shadow capacity, and I certainly do as a Queensland-based minister, knows that the resources sector is incredibly excited about the opportunities that exist for investment in a, in a range of commodities. Uh, of course, critical minerals, um, massive opportunities in that front, particularly in the north of our country. Uh, in some of the more traditional minerals as well, there are massive opportunities there as well. And I have every expectation that while ever commodity prices remain high, as they currently are, mine, the mining industry will invest in those projects so that they can generate those profits. Thank you, Minister. Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. With $100 million cuts, budget cuts to critical minerals funding, irresponsible IR legislation, a mining tax 2.0 thought bubble, can the minister confirm how many of the 46 <coughs> critical minerals projects currently in the pipeline will not proceed under Labor? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. S uh, minister. Well, <laughs> I, I'm not the minister representing the Minister for Resources. Uh, so I'm happy to come back with a specific answer, or perhaps Senator Farrell, as the minister representing uh, the Minister for Resources, is better, is better prepared to answer a question of that nature. Uh, but again, this government, our position on critical minerals has been clear for some time. We have been the ones out there for the last 10 years, while you guys have been arguing amongst yourselves about whether climate change is real and whether we should have renewable industry energy. We've been the ones actually calling for the kind of investment in critical minerals Order. that will allow those kind of developments to occur. <laughs> um, so please don't give us some lecture about critical minerals and who wants to actually bring on the kind of transition towards renewable energy uh, and batteries and all the kind of things that critical minerals involve. <laughs> Our government has been backing that ever since we were elected, and we were backing it a hell of a lot earlier than that. Uh, thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Shoebridge. Order. Order. I just called Senator Shoebridge and he couldn't hear it because of the noise in the chamber. Thank you, President. <clears throat> um, Pre President, my question is directed <coughs> to the Honourable Penny Wong, representing the Minister for Climate Change and en Energy. Minister, communities across the west of New South Wales are experience experiencing record floods, with lives lost, property destroyed and towns in shock after an already devastating 12 months, with major flooding affecting the Lachlan, Murray, Murrumbidgee rivers, amongst others. <coughs> Residents in Forbes, Condoblin, Daniloquin, Yugowra, Walgett, Colorannabri, town after town, are being subject to major floods. Minister, do you accept that these major flooding events are being driven by and exacerbated by climate change? Uh, thank you, Senator Shoebridge, Minister. Th thank you, President. Well, Senator Shoebridge, I think I'm on the record for many years in accepting uh, that there uh, actually, since I was climate minister in 2007 and in the 2007 <coughs> campaign, where we campaigned for an emissions trading scheme, which you also supported at the time, I've been on on the record for many years, well over a decade, which shows you I've been here a bit, <laughs> a fair while, 
uh, in, in accepting the scientific advice about the consequence of climate change. I, I recall reading a CSIRO report many years ago in the last decade which, told, uh, which forecast that unmitigated climate change would see the Goida line move south of Clare. For those of us who come from South Australia and understand uh, what that means, that was horrif horrifying. Uh, it's all, that is what has informed, in part, uh, my commitment and our government's commitment, certainly in government last time, uh, to implement an ambitious emissions trading scheme, which I, I realise you weren't there, but your party voted with the coalition against. That's, right. That's why, in government, we delivered uh, a climate scheme uh, when the Greens did decide to vote for it. Uh, perhaps not quite as ambitious, but uh, important nevertheless. And that is why, for nine, for nine years, we, in opposition, have argued each election, notwithstanding the challenge of that, uh, for uh, a clear, credible, uh, ambitious position on climate. Uh, and I am very pleased that, after years of irrationality, that the Australian community has returned not only a government— um, Thank you, Senator Wong. Um, Senator Shoebridge, I have already drawn to your attention you do not start saying point of order the minute you stand. You wait. I give you the call, and then you tell me what the issue is. So, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, it's relevance. We're a minute and a half into the answer on floods and the terrible floods that are happening now, and the minister has not once addressed them. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Senator Shoebridge. Order, order, order. I have the minister on her feet. Minister, uh, please go ahead. Thank I'll you. remind you the question was about the floods. Yes, uh, I, and as I said at the outset, I'm sorry if the senator needs me to repeat it, but I am on the record for, de uh, for over a decade. In ex wow. Would you like to speak, Senator Wish Wilson? I notice you always want to interject. Would you like to? You go right ahead, mate. Senator Wish Wilson. I, I did get an invitation. Uh, Senator uh, Wish Wilson, President, do you have no, a point no, of order? No, thank you. Minister Wong. If. He's, always so he's always so keen to interject, particularly on some people, that uh, we'll give you leave, eh, if that's what you want. Senator Shoebridge, I'm sorry, I, I was actually genuinely trying to answer your question. I have always accepted the scientific advice about the consequences of climate change. I also recognise, and this is where our parties do differ, uh, that uh, you need to actually have policies to meet a target and recognise that uh, the, ensuring that you meet a target of reductions in emissions Thank you, Minister. Your time uh, is a has tough expired. policy. Senator Shoebridge, first supplementary. Uh, Minister, when Brisbane was devastated by flooding in 2011, we all had to pay to clean it up through a flood recovery levy. Now we're making our children pay through increased government debt, and all the while coal and gas companies are still making billions and fossil fuel subsidies of a staggering $11.6 billion a year. Why won't your government make coal and gas companies pay for disaster preparedness and to rebuild and support these devastating communities, since they created the problem in the first place? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister. Uh, well, the, the problem—I appreciate that the— uh, the, the, the political ob uh, object of that question is to try and, and suggest that only one part of the economy has responsibility, only one sector in society has responsibility. The reality is this is a whole of economy, a whole of society response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a whole of economy and a whole of society response. And we, we, we'll be able to deal with it if we deal with it together. But if all we do is point the finger at different parts of our society or different parts of our economy, we will never get that. The hard reality is this country has prospered greatly. We have all prospered greatly, including with, uh, with the education system that has been funded th uh, uh, through, through government revenue uh, from uh, the exports that we have made over decades. And now what we have to do is transition our economy over time to a world that will be a net zero emission world. That is a big challenge, and it's not one by, that's achieved by pointing the Thank finger. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Shoebridge, second uh, supplementary. Minister, many Australians are pleased to hear the change in rhetoric on climate. Uh, myself, I'm pleased to hear that change in rhetoric on climate, some of which you've repeated here. But how is that rhetoric? going to protect us from the carbon emissions of the coal and gas projects that your government keeps continuing to support? And how are you going to answer that 
to the people in Western New South Wales who have climate-induced flooding right now. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge, Minister. Uh, well, well, what we will do is do what we said we would do before the election. Uh, and that is to put this economy, which is a highly inten carbon intensive economy, onto a, an ambitious 2030 target of 43 per cent reduction and a 2050 target of net zero. And unlike, and what we will do in government is not simply do rhetoric, but actually do policy which delivers it, because that is the key. We actually have to change the direction in which our economy, along with the global economy, is heading. And no amount of, as I said, blaming others and looking to the past and pointing the finger is going to actually achieve what is, what is, what is an ambitious transformation of our domestic economy and the global economy. I wish, I wish that the world at Copenhagen had done more. I really do. It was, it, was, it was one of the saddest moments I've ever been involved with in politics, for the reasons to which you avert. Thank you, Minister. Your uh, time has expired. Thank you, Minister. Senator Grogan. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Minister Watt. Um, the government intends to reform Australia's workplace relations laws to get wages moving. Can you outline for us what the changes are and why they are necessary and what the urgency is? Thank you, Senator Grogan. Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Grogan. And I know that you have a very long record in standing up for the interests of workers, and it's great to see you continue to that work uh, since you've been here in the Senate. The Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill delivers on the Albanese government's commitment to a fairer workplace relations system which provides Australians with job security, gender equality and sustainable wage growth. For nearly 10 years, wages were kept low by the coalition as a deliberate design feature of their management of the economy. None of us will ever forget that infamous interview with former Senator Matthias Cormann, where he belled the cat on the economic policy of this government and its desire to keep wages low. In contrast, the Albanese Labor government is taking action to improve workplace conditions, wages and job security by implementing our election commitments and outcomes from the Jobs and Skills Summit, which brought employers, unions and the community together in a way we had never seen under the former government. The truth is that the current workplace relations system is not working well for workers or employers, and it's not fit to meet our economy's current challenges. In particular, the bargaining system is broken, and we've all heard over recent weeks, Senator Cash in particular, that but other members of the opposition say that what we're proposing to do is terrible, it'll make the sky fall in, it'll have all these kind of consequences. The one thing I can guarantee you is that if we don't make changes to Australia's bargaining system, if we do persist with the, uh, with the regime that was in place under the coalition, we can guarantee the same outcome, which is low wages and low productivity well into the future. The current system, presided over by the coalition, is not delivering the fairness, gender equality or economic growth that Australia needs and that Australian workers deserve. The bill aims to tackle insecure work, gender inequality and flatlining wages. And as for why this bill is urgent, Australian workers have waited long enough. Uh, they've been waiting very long time for a decent pay rise, for wages to keep up uh, with the cost of living and to, do, and to help them with the cost thank of living, you, and we're going to do something expired. about it. Senator Grogan, first supplementary. Thank you. Um, thank you, Minister Watt. That was very useful. Um, you referenced the Jobs and Skills Summit, uh, which I was honoured to attend. Um, since that time, we've seen many, many scare campaigns, which I've been quite surprised about um, regarding these new proposed laws. Um, could you please outline for us uh, where the errors are in these scare campaigns? Minister. Thank you, Senator Grogan. And I'm not surprised that Senator Cash is feeling a bit sensitive about scare campaigns because most of them have come from her. Uh, but here's a few facts for Senator Cash. And, and, and uh, Minister Burke took the National Press Club through this the other day, but, but in case Senator Cash missed it, I'm here to repeat them. The first scare campaign that we've been hearing from the opposition is that this bill will produce coast-to-coast -coast strikes. In actual fact, the bill makes industrial action harder with an additional requirement for mandatory conciliation before industrial action can be taken. Ballots need to be agreed on by an employer Order. by employer basis as and per the current Senator rules. Watt. And don't they react? Senator don't Watt, they... oh. please resume Sorry. your seat. I'll just wait until there's quiet. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Minister. 
Don't they react when the first of their scare campaigns get called out? But you know what? I've got about four more to go through. Uh, their second scare campaign is about patent bargaining. Uh, but in actual fact, the restrictions on taking industrial action when the bargaining representative is engaging in patent bargaining are already in the Fair Work Act. Uh, and they are not changing, not a word, not even a comma. So, in fact, what we're hearing from the opposition is a scare campaign about their Thank own you, policy. Minister. And I've got the three more. The time has expired. Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Uh, Senator Watt, I wonder if you would uh, be able to, uh, Minister Watt, I wonder if you'd be able to um, step out for us the difference in the workplace laws from previous approaches, because I think it may be very beneficial for those in this chamber to hear the detail of that. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Minister Watt. I would be delighted, Senator Grogan, to, to point out how our plans for workplace laws differ from those that we've seen previously, because the contrast between the Albanese Labor government's approach and the coalition's when it comes to workplace laws could not be starker. On the one hand, we have Labor wanting to get wages moving again. On the other hand, we have the coalition for whom low wages was a deliberate design feature of the economy. For under Labor, you have higher productivity for businesses. Under the coalition, you have lower productivity. Under Labor, you have more agreements, a workplace relations law system that encourages more agreements. Under the coalition, you hear exactly what we're hearing over there, which is more conflict. They are addicted to conflict in the workplace and they want to hang on to it. We actually want to bring in more agreements between employers and employees. For the coalition, it is never the right time for a pay rise. For years they told us that low unemployment would deliver pay rises. We now have unemployment and we're not getting the pay rises going on with it. We saw Senator Birmingham on Insiders yesterday mumbling and fumbling his way through Thank you, the Senator answer to the question what? about how uh, you get wage your time rises has moving. Expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Over the last three months, the Iranian regime has been accused of killing more than 300 civilians standing up for human rights, particularly Iranian women and girls. When the Prime Minister was asked by the opposition two weeks ago why sanctions had not been applied to the Iranian officials responsible for the killing of its citizens, he said that the government was considering the implications of doing so for Australian businesses. The Iranian-Australian community has been calling for weeks for the Australian government to hold the Iranian regime to account. Has the government now applied any sanctions? And if not, why not? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister Wong. Minister Wong, beg your pardon. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Well, the senator did canvass some of this uh, in uh, estimates, and I, I will repeat what I said to the senator uh, on that occasion, uh, which is uh, uh, there is, uh, I think, uh, bipartisan or multi-party uh, condemnation of what is occurring in Iran. Uh, which is also why the, the government uh, has been very forward-leaning uh, in, in its public statements of condemnation, uh, its engagement through DFAT with the uh, charge here, and also at the UN General Assembly. Uh, uh, and I went, took the, the senator through uh, the interaction the government had had, including the, the statement at the, the General Assembly on the human rights situation in Iran. We supported calls for a special session of the Human Rights Council to address the deteriorating human rights situation in Iran. Uh, I, uh, on social media, expressed support for the Canada and New Zealand, Australia and New Zealand statement at the UN Security Council, highlighting our concerns about Iran's membership of, uh, on the UN Commission on the Status of Women, a body that Iran joined under, whilst the coalition was in government. Uh, we joined Canada and New Zealand in expressing those concerns to the UN Security Council. We delivered a uh, further statement uh, to the UN uh, Third Committee Interactive Dialogue. Uh, and uh, I can go back further. Uh, I've engaged with uh, counterparts, including Melanie Jolie, as recently as last week about this, this issue. In relation to sanctions, as Senator Payne and Senator Bishop uh, and Ms Bishop would have said before me, we don't uh, engage in public speculation about sanctions, and you will understand why not. Uh, but I would encourage the senator. I understand uh, that uh, this is an issue um, that many people are concerned about. This isn't a partisan issue. Thank you, Minister. This is an Your issue we are all joining. Senator Chandler, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Since the Prime Minister's comments, the Iranian government has used its military to fire on and kill innocent civilians, including children like nine-year-old Kian Pifalek, 
who died after security forces opened fire on the car he and his parents were in. When will the government do more than give lip service to the women and girls of Iran and the Iranian Australians calling for Australia to take action? Uh, thank you, Senator Chandler, Minister. Well, look, uh, I, I, don't, I disagree with the lip service point. <coughs> that seems to suggest the only way in which uh, a government can express its view with the many regimes and, in, and countries with which we do not agree is by sanctions. And if that is the case, then there were almost no expression. There was almost no expression in support of human rights under the coalition, almost none. So my point, my point is, my point is this: um, there are a great many states in this world, uh, some in our region. Uh, whose actions we do not agree with. And sometimes you're right. Sometimes you know, we, we look at what are the hardest form of expression of that. Uh, you know, the UN, UN sanctions are an example of that. Uh, the, the, the sanctions on North Korea and Russia are an, are an example on that, on that. But what we also should do is what Australia has been doing, which is bilaterally and multilaterally, add our voice at our voice in condemnation of what is occurring Thank in you, Iran. Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Senator Chandler, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Since the Prime Minister said Australia was still thinking about taking action, the international community, including the United States and the EU, have imposed sanctions on companies and individuals involved in the production or transfer of Iranian drones that have been used by Russia in attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure in Ukraine. When will Australia catch up to the rest of the international community, and when will the government use the Magnitsky-style laws passed by this parliament for the express purpose of holding to account those responsible for the most egregious human rights abuses? Thank you, Senator Chandler. Minister. I, I, think, the, yeah. um, <clears throat> I thank the senator for her question. We, we actually implement the full suite of UN Security Council mandated sanctions on Iran, uh, an autonomous sanction regime to pr prohibit uh, the transfer of conventional arms to Iran. Uh, in fact, it's on this basis that we have imposed previously, and I acknowledge um, this is, I think, was Ms Bishop from memory, but it may also have been Senator Payne who continued them, targeted sanctions on Iran's Islamic Re Revolutionary Guard Corps as a whole and a number of IRGC, um, uh, Iran Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, Corps linked officials, financial and travel entities, which I think may have been imposed by Senator Payne. Uh, in relation to the uh, provision of armed drones and missiles, uh, that is a deeply concerning uh, report. We condemn any arms transfers to Russia uh, to support its illegal aggression against Ukraine, and we, have call, we call you, upon Minister. all Your countries from, to refrain Senator from supporting Pauline. Russia. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. Could the Minister outline the government's approach to trade policy? Thank you, Senator Pollock. Minister. Thank you. And, uh, yes, I, yes, I can, uh, <coughs> Senator yes, Polly. And uh, thank you for the wonderful job you do on the behalf of the people of Tasmania. And I know, I know you know all of the benefits that. Uh, Come to, uh, come to Tasmania from free trade. And open trade is a net positive for Australia. Uh, recent uh, analysis uh, show that uh, one in four jobs is uh, related to trade in this country, and many of them in Tasmania, I might add. Uh, and jobs and export industries pay 5 per cent above the national average income. As uh, outlined in my speech on the 14th of November to the uh, APEC Study Centre in Melbourne, there are four principles guiding uh, Australia's approach to international trade and investment under this government. The first principle is that to meet the challenges of our time, we need to deepen and diversify our trading relationships. Placing all your trade eggs in the one basket has proved bad economic strategy. Secondly, Australia is working collabor collaborative co collaboratively with like-minded partners to support an open, rules-based, multi-trading system that works in Australia's interests. And thirdly, we're investing in ourselves using industry policy to ensure Australia's exports are more complex, of higher value 
and more sophisticated. And finally, uh, the fourth principle is the trade uh, must be a driver of inclusive economic growth and greater economic well-being for all Australians. More trade, not less, is a key part of how we build an economic future uh, that we want in Australia, a future of secure, high-paying jobs. Your time has expired. Senator Polly, first supplementary. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Thank you for that informative answer, Minister. How will the new free trade agreements support the government's trade policy agenda? Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, Senator, for that other uh, question, and uh, thank you, uh, President, uh, for the opportunity to answer a terrific question. Um, a key plank of our trade policy agenda is trade diversification. This means helping Australian businesses grow and develop new markets for their exports, and to find new and deeper sources of investment. Today, our government is delivering this commitment by debating legislation. Uh, in the House of Representatives, which will bring the uh, Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement and the Australia-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement into force. The India uh, Free Trade Agreement will eliminate tariffs on 90 per cent of Australians, uh, Australia's exports to India. The Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement—well, you didn't do it. You had a chance to do it, and you didn't do it. But we're doing the job. We're doing the job. The Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement will el eliminate. Thank you, Minister. The time oh, has expired. Senator Polly, second supplementary. The minister recently participated in trade negotiations to launch the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. What is the framework, and how will participation support Australia's trade policy agenda, Minister? Minister. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Rapoli, for that. Um, President, President, recently, recently I joined uh, ministers from 13 other partners across the Indo-Pacific in Los Angeles to launch negotiations on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or IPEF, as it's known. IPEF members uh, include eight of our top ten trading partners and key regional allies like the United States, Japan, Korea, India, Indonesia and, of course, our Pacific neighbour, Fiji. The framework will cover new and emerging trade issues, including supply chains, clean energy, infrastructure, tax and anti-corruption. IPEF is an important part of the Albanese Labor government's trade policy agenda. That will help businesses expand and support high-paying jobs. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Wong. Thank you. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. And Senator Birmingham, I was a bit incomplete before. I'll review that question and, if necessary, come back to the chamber. Thank you. Senator McGrath. Thank you. I um, rise to take note of all answers to all questions asked by coalition senators. I'm going to begin with the, the question asked by, by Senator Hume in relation uh, to, to gas policy and gas prices and energy prices. And we shouldn't forget—and it's hard to forget—that the Labor Party 97 times, that's 97 times before the election, 97 times, Senator Cadell, promised 97 times that they would cut power bills by $275. It was one of those core promises of the Labor Party. They were going to cut your power bills by $275. 97 times they said that. And yet we find in, in the budget, in the budget papers, and it was in very small font, I think about font size eight or nine, that, that, that actually power prices under the Labor Party are going to go up 56%. 56 per cent they're going to go up, uh, uh, Mr Deputy President, and that's, that's not 15.6 per cent or 5.6 per cent or 0.56 per cent. That is 56 per cent. So we have a Labor Party who are in power who promised to cut power bills by $275, and yet we find a Labor Party who instead are going to, through their policy in action 
and actually through the decisions they are making. So it's that axis of any decisions they do make are going to be the wrong decisions, and the decisions they don't make are also going to be the wrong decisions. So we're going to end up with, with power bills going up by 56 per cent. Indeed, the, the average Australian family are going to be $2,000 worse off by Christmas because of the policies of, of the Labor Party. Mr Deputy President, Labor are always going to cost you more. They're going to cost you more with your power bills. They're going to cost you more with, 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 with your interest rates. They're going to cost you more when your rent goes up. They're going to cost you more when unemployment goes up, which is going up at the moment under the policies of, of, of the Labor Party. Because what we're seeing, what we're seeing with the Labor Party and, and their, their radical and their extreme industrial relation policies, and Senator Wong is laughing, but we've got radical and extreme industrial relation policies that are so, so, so anti, so anti small business. And I stand here as a, as a senator for Queensland and a strong and proud proponent of small businesses across all of Queensland. And the ones that I speak to, and, and when I was um, left home about, about a week ago, I was, I was chatting to, um, I won't probably name them because I don't want the Labor Party and the unions picking on them, but some of the, some of the people I, I buy stuff from in, in Warwick, and they are terrified terrified about the radical and extreme industrial relation policies that are going to come down, because they don't want to get caught up into this vortex of the Labor Party paying back their union, their union paymasters, Mr Deputy President. And that's what, what we're seeing with these radical and extreme industrial relations policies. So the poor, poor Australian people, not only do they have Mr Albanese as Prime Minister, heaven help all of us, but they've got 56 per cent rises in, in power bills, and they've got radical industrial relation policies. And when you look into, when you look into what the government is not doing or doing in relation to gas, you should be very scared. Because not only did the government in its, in its recent budget uh, reduce support for gas exploration, reduce support for ensuring that we have reliable energy across Australia, what they did was they gave $10 million to the Environmental Defender's Office. $10 million to, to the radical, to the extreme Environmental Defender's Office. So effectively the Labor Party are funding extreme left-wing greenies to stop the progress of, or the progress of, 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 of commerce and business and of resource development in Australia. So if you're wondering about a year's time or two years' time why your power bills have gone up so much, it is because of the policies of the Labor Party. The policies that, 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 that the ministers today could not answer questions on in relation to what is going to happen with whether it's your power bills or whether it's in relation to how much your, your pay may go up. And we all want, we all want um, Australians' pay to go up, but the minister was asked a direct question today about how much will, will people's pay go up under the Labor Party, and all we got was, was a bunch of waffle, uh, a lot of waffle. Uh, and it's not like the, the waffle that you, could, you can get and eat out, that comes out of a Jaffa line. It was the waffle that just causes you to lose the will to live, listening to those answers. So it is very, very sad that the Australian people will have higher power bills and actually will not get the pay rises they deserve because of the policy Thank inaction you, of, of the Labor Party. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, what a load of waffle that was. From the best waffler in this place, I must say. Just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, honestly, we heard the most ridiculous questions coming from that side. I mean, the question that Senator Macdonald asked Senator Watt about the mining industry and the loss of 33,000 jobs. What a ridiculous statement to make. Absolutely ridiculous. What they haven't listened to is the fact that the Minister for Industrial Relations has listened to feedback. We on this side actually go out and talk to people when we form policy. We've, we've gone out, we've listened to feedback about how to make sensible improvements to practical applications of the bill. That's what we're doing. And we are continuing to consult as the bill progresses through the Senate. So those discussions are continuing to happen. The Minister for Workplace Relations and his department, putting you to sleep, am I, Senator Dunham over there? making you yawn. Well, listen, you might hear something. We talk to people. We actually go out and talk uh, to people. Senator Urquhart, to resist uh, commenting on the 
disposition of the members to my left. I don't need assistance. Senator I couldn't Mayor. help it. He was yawning while I was speaking. <laughs> he was yawning continue, while I was Senator, speaking. Okay. Um, and I uh, thought I was loud enough to keep him awake, Deputy President. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. Please don't reflect on the, on the disposition of the member. <laughs> the, to my um, the Minister for Workplace Relations and his department have consulted closely with businesses, the businesses that the people on the other side have pretended are scared, with unions who actually represent the workers in this place, even though they don't like to use that word, they actually do represent the, the workers and they have a place in, in businesses. And civil society, and we've, we've dealt with all of those and we've consulted and we will continue to consult with all of those during the design of those reforms. And as I said, we are continuing. We're continuing to have cons consultations with stakeholders around concerns that small businesses have raised and the better off overall test to ensure that no worker is left off. I don't know why on that side you have a problem with workers getting a pay rise. Do you ever go out and talk to workers? Because we do. Workers like me who used to work in a factory many years ago struggle. They're struggling today to make ends meet because for 10 years, while you guys were in charge, they had no wage increase. In fact, their wages were driven down and they had no ability. Low paid workers, aged care workers, uh, cleaners, child care workers, laid pay, uh, low paid workers who helped us through the pandemic that we had, who worked day in, day out to provide for us to be able to get through the pandemic. And all you want to do is suppress their wages and keep them down while the costs of living are rising. And we know that. This, there is an inflation challenge. Senator Gallagher said that in her answer to the question to Senator Cash, and we know that. But there is times when workers need wage rises, and they need it now. And I think the scaremongering about job losses is just simply that. It is scaremongering. It is not, it is not a reality. We know that under, this, under the previous government, under, over that side of the chamber, wages were the lowest growth on record. Low, real wages went down for years and years and years under you guys over there, and workers really struggled. There's, we know that higher productivity is when, you, when workers get good wage, wage rises, we know that they get higher productivity. That is demonstrated by, by workers who are paid proper wages. But of course you don't know about that because you kept wages down for 10 years. The, we had hearings of this inquiry. There were five days of hearings, and I might say that was more public hearings than any other workplace-related bill inquiry since the first uh, Fair Work Act commenced over a decade ago. So more hearings on this bill than what you people had over there when you made changes to the Act. And we heard from uh, employers, the committee that run that, the Education and Employment Committee, heard from employers, employer groups, the ACTU, in individual unions, workers, not-for-profit organisations, academics and the Department of Employment Workplace Relations. We know that there is a consultation that is still happening, as I said, as it moves through the Senate. We have consulted. And you guys should stop that scaremongering because it just frightens people. And it's ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous. People uh, deserve to get wage increases. People look to us and they will get a wage increase through the Labor Party and through the government now. And they deserve it because for 10 years you kept them suppressed and their wages Thank suppressed. You, Senator, Kurt. Senator Smith. Very much, Mr. Deputy President. In these final two weeks of Parliament, the matter that will be top of mind for many senators will be discussions, the debate, and the resolution of the Labor government's new industrial relations platform. West Australians are confused. The government, it's fair to say, enjoyed strong electoral support in Western Australia. It won the seat of Pearce, it won the seat of Hasluck, it won a Senate spot. So West Australians can't understand why is it now that this Labor government 
has decided so quickly, and I think today marks the six-month anniversary of the election of the government, West Australians can't understand why this new Labor government is now turning its back on West Australians, and importantly, turning its back on what is a critical part of the West Australian economy, indeed the most critical part of Australia's prosperity, and that is the mining and resources sector. There are six words that West Australians should not forget. It's not our policy, said Jim Chalmers. Jim Chalmers said before the election that wholesale industrial relations reform was not the policy of the government. Now, after the election, Jim Chalmers and the Prime Minister and Labor senators are saying it is the central piece of their so-called economic plan to improve wages in Australia. It's not our policy, said Jim Chalmers, for everybody to hear, and just six months later we are now in the Senate chamber, and it is the centrepiece of the last two weeks of this parliamentary sitting period. So let's just be very, very clear about why this is so central, why it is important for coalition senators like myself and Senator Cardell and others to stand up and argue against this industrial relations plan, which will damage the mining and resources sector in Western Australia and indeed across the whole country. Let's be clear about this. The mining and resources sector earns for this whole country $43 billion of export revenue. Secondly, it employs over 277,000 people. And importantly for the government, which makes it more surprising that it will be turning its back on the mining and resources sector, is that it generates just over $43 billion in tax revenue for Australian governments. So West Australians have a right to be very, very distrustful. So early on in the term of this government, why is it, having enjoyed such electoral success in Western Australia six months ago, they are now in the final two weeks of this parliament deciding to turn their back on such a significant, if not the most significant industry in Western Australia, and such an important industry across our whole country. The problem with Labor is that you can't believe what they say. You can't believe what they say. Coalition senators on this side of the Senate are surprised that so early in the term of this new government, their mistruths, their lack of honesty, their ability to wholesale change policy commitments given prior to the election are now there for the whole community to see. Mm -hmm. And West Australians have seen it with great clarity. These industrial relations reforms will damage the mining and resources sector. The sector itself says 33,000 jobs are at risk as a result of the multi-employer bargaining changes, in addition to new taxing proposals that are proposed by the government. We know, the industry tells us, that this will imperil $77 billion worth of projects. 140 projects subject to pre-final investment decisions will now be at risk as a result of new taxes and these industrial relations reform. Labor has betrayed West Australian voters. Senator Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. It's pretty tough to sit through the faux concern this question time around Labor's policies on energy, and particularly our policies on power prices, when we've just sat through a decade where we had 22 failed attempts to deliver an energy policy in this country. Now, those failed attempts weren't just a catastrophic failure of policy aptitude, 
They left businesses, they left many in our community without the, the certainty they needed to be able to make investment decisions, to be able to make decisions on behalf of their businesses, to drive investment and growth. And that lack of policy certainty has left us behind on an international scale when it comes to Australian businesses and our approach and responses to climate change. For a decade, we saw the other side argue about whether climate change existed, not doing the hard and detailed policy work required to deliver an energy policy that would deliver certainty to Australian businesses. And that's what they now have under an Albanese Labor government. Already, we legislated 43 per cent by 2030, net zero by 2050, policies enshrined by law to give that certainty to our business community to drive investment in renewable energy and technology. And that's backed up by our Powering Australia policy, which is designed to put more energy into the grid, renewable energy, which is our cheapest form of energy, which will put pressure on energy prices. So I would argue that the concern expressed in question time today was faux concern if you were really concerned about getting the policy levers in place to make a meaningful difference on energy prices and indeed on climate change, you would have spent the last decade designing an energy policy that you could deliver. Now that's not to say the impact of energy prices at the moment in the cost of living challenges before us isn't very real and isn't very serious. Of course it is, and that's something that our government is looking at and work is underway, as Minister Gallagher has said in question time today. And that's in addition to the other measures we're taking to address the cost of living crisis, measures like making access to early learning and education more affordable for over one million families, a piece of legislation being worked through the Senate today. Expand, extending pay, uh, paid parental leave by six months to 2026, delivering cheaper medicines and more affordable housing. And yes, as was discussed today, getting wages moving again. Now, unlike the other side, where keeping wages low was a deliberate feature of the economic architecture, we are unashamedly keen to put to get wages moving again. We've supported an increase to the minimum wage. We've supported a wage rise for aged care workers. But there is more work to do to fix the broken bargaining system that we are currently dealing with in Australia. And that's what the legislation that I hope we will be debating in this chamber soon will seek to deal with. Addressing wages for workers like our early childhood workers who do some of the most important work in our country, nation-building, life-changing work, and whose wages have failed to keep up with the value they are contributing to our community. We need to fix the broken bargaining system so we can support workers like our early childhood workers and indeed many low-paid workers across our economy who are being left behind by our current industrial relations system. So I welcome a debate on that, and I welcome the debate which will happen in this chamber in the next few weeks. Deputy President, uh, the other Senator Smith mentioned that today is indeed the six-month anniversary of the Albanese Labor government, and it's an anniversary uh, which I think is worth celebrating. Already our government has taken significant action to fix the mess and the failures of the previous government over the past decade, failures in age aged care, failures in early learning, failures on wages fixing our overseas relationships. Overwhelmingly, what I hear most often as I travel around South Australia is that it finally feels like adults are in charge of the government and doing the work that they expect their government to be doing. That's what our government is about, not uh, feigning faux concern over policies you know, you actually had a decade to do something about it. If you really genuinely cared about getting wages moving, you wouldn't have made low wages a deliberate feature of the economic architecture. If you really cared about tackling energy prices and tackling climate change, you would have delivered an energy policy one time along those 22 attempts, which actually worked and actually delivered for Australians. It's faux concern. We're doing real work. Senator Little. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, it's now clearer than ever that Labor is not committed to the resources sector, that is, those jobs for many locals in associated industries or FIFO workers. Mining companies are now warning that up to 33,000 jobs are at risk from a potential new mining tax 2.0 from Labor 
as well as their multi-employer bargaining changes. Senator Watt rejected those numbers. So who are you listening to? Yes, your favourite unions? This would imperil projects valued of up to $77 billion, spreading investment uncertainty and contagion. Who would invest amid an environment of operating and investment uncertainty? The mining sector has identified 140 projects subject to pre-final investment decisions that would be at risk from new taxes and ill-thought-through industrial relations changes. Of those 140 projects, 46 of them are critical minerals projects, critical minerals which are supposed to be part of the renewal technology supply chain Labor keeps talking about. Mining companies themselves are saying these changes will slow down Australia's energy transformation and that we need more lithium for batteries, more copper for solar panels and more cobalt for electric vehicles, not more uncertainty and risk that will simply chase away investment from our shores at this crucial hour. On multi-employer bargaining, not to mention the risk with Labor's rushed industrial relations policy, which will only lead to more strike action and which will put mine developments at risk of cancellation or delay. The proposed workplace changes represent the most radical shake-up of Australia's industrial relations systems in decades. Such reform with so little consultation except with the unions. Labor have made it clear they want to hand over all workplaces to the unions. Small, medium and large businesses opposed it. I've heard it myself. Industry-wide bargaining will be devastating for the mining sector and the broader Australian economy, leading to widespread strike action, including potential sympathy strikes by those unrelated to a particular dispute, just like we saw in the 1970s. In my own state of South Australia, SA mining production is worth in the vicinity of $5.4 billion a year. What's the risk to that under this policy? The introduction of multi-employed bargaining is a brief breach of faith with all Australian businesses who took the Treasurer at his word when he said last year that industry-wide bargaining was not, that is, was not Labor's policy. I heard it and so did the Australian public. This needlessly threatens the mining industry that earns over $413 billion in exports, employs over 277,000 Australians in high-paid jobs and contributes $43.2 billion in taxes in 2021. In the last 20 years, employment in mining has tripled and wages doubled, benefiting hundreds of thousands of Australians, especially in regional areas. In what is a recurring theme, Labor has no plan to support jobs in the economy. Labor is not supporting Australian families struggling with increasing cost of living. And clearly, Labor does not support the resources industry. While the coalition wholeheartedly supports mining and the jobs it creates, Labor is beholden to its own left wing and their allies in the Australian Greens who want to shut down the resources industry and the jobs of thousands of Australians, including those in regional and remote areas. Who are they listening to? Businesses actually delivering jobs for Australians in those areas? They don't like that you didn't consult with them on the common interest test or multi-employer bargaining or the removal of the ABCC. Your union masters like it, though. I'll put, I'll put the question to the motion moved by Senator McGrath. Those for the question say aye, against no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise today to take note of the questions asked by uh, my colleague Senator Cox to uh, the leader of the government in the House here, Senator Wong, in relation to the government's commitment on uh, climate action and why on earth Australia continues to fund fossil fuel subsidies. Of course, Senator Cox spoke eloquently about uh, the uh, COP27 negotiations, and we know, of course, that this last fortnight has been uh, a tough 
uh, a tough two weeks, not just for those negotiating uh, the final text at COP27, but a tough week for the planet. Because what we saw out of these negotiations is, while steps forward in some respects, terrible steps backwards in others, and of course a intransigent uh, attitude from those governments uh, who continue to want to fund uh, publicly uh, the uh, expansion and continued operation of fossil fuels. And the reality is, when we look at the science, it is crystal clear that we, can, we cannot continue to expand and open new fossil fuel projects if we are to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees. In fact, even if we want to keep temperatures below 2 degrees, there is no way we can continue to open uh, more uh, gas, gas, coal or oil projects, not just here in Australia but around the world. And Australia, of course, has a huge role to play in this. We remain the third largest export in the world of fossil fuels. Do you know what that means, Mr Acting Deputy President? That means we are the, we are the third largest exporter of pollution dangerous climate change pollution in the world, and we have to take some responsibility for that, which is why Senator Cox asked the government today in question time, when will we stop funding uh, fossil fuel companies to continue to expand and grow? When will we end in this country the uh, unneeded, unnecessary, dangerous fossil fuel subsidies that litter our national government budget? And of course, we didn't get a response uh, from Senator Wong. Uh, but what we did hear uh, from um, both this government and others was a reluctance to do anything um, that is needed in relation to winding back those fossil fuel subsidies. There also was a question, of course, uh, that goes to an important element of the discussions and negotiations uh, that were had at COP27, and this was in relation to the loss and damages commitments. This is an important step forward, that rich, wealthy countries, those who do have done a lot of the polluting already, help to pay for those less wealthy countries who are suffering now because climate, the climate crisis is here and is only going to get worse. And it is important that we have a proper commitment from the Australian government in relation to this. And I just want to make a point that while we were in Senate question time here in this place today, over in the other place, the leader of the opposition, the man who thinks that he should be prime minister, decided to attack the world's poorest people, to attack the, the poorest countries in, on the globe over this particular clause that was negotiated at COP27. That is, of course, Mr Dutton, the same bloke who laughed at the suggestion of water lapping at the doors of uh, the, our Pacific neighbours, laughing at the horrors that these countries now face because of the pollution that Australia continues to export and the climate crisis that our nation continues to drive worse and worse. The man who wants to be prime minister in this country, the leader of the Liberal Party, is laughing and now playing the dirtiest, lowest politics of all. He suggested that we shouldn't, Australia should not play a role in this because charity, quote, starts at home. I mean, is this really the attitude from today's Liberal Party that not only do they not believe in climate change, now they think that they can also rip off the world's poorest people? And I'd like to know in this place today whether the moderates in the Liberal Party, Senator Birmingham, for example, from my home state in South Australia, what do you say about the fact that the Leader of the Opposition thinks the world's poorest should just drown? I'll put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it.